Hello there everyone, welcome to the channel if you're new, welcome back if you aren't, I'm EDJ, and so we're kind of hot on the heels of Julius Caesar, you know, right now on every Friday for Historia Civilis and every Wednesday for Kings and Generals, and so, but there are many videos, Roman videos, particularly from Historia Civilis that didn't fit the Caesar chronology, so I'm gonna be covering them here on Thursdays. So there's like about like 17 of these. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rough through this, guys. We're gonna do this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm interested to see it. I'll probably I, I think it's good that I'll be watching these like the Roman Palm Perimium Palm Perimium um, and the Triumph After. So I'll probably it'll probably help you know probably give me more of insight into Rome. So um. Yeah, I don't know what this is, the... Gosh darn it, wait. Okay, let's find out. The Roman Pomerium. Pomerium. Pomerium, of course. Okay, point is, the Roman Pomerium. So I don't know exactly what it is, but... I'm... Yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, that, but that's... Thank goodness I'm watching this video because I'm about to find out what it is. And if you want to find out what it is without me being here in the corner or pausing or talking, the link is down in the description down below. With that said, and without any further ado, let's rock this. According to legend, Rome was founded on a murder. <laughs> you know, yeah, Romulus and Remus, right? The, the legend of the founding of, of Rome. One brother murdered the other, and it's interesting that that's the founding of Rome. That's the mythological founding that everyone agrees on and kind of proud of. Like, yay, we, we were founded by murderers, <laughs> by a murderer, by a murderer. So that's... Now I think about it, that's almost fitting for Rome, ain't it? <laughs> like, what other, what other way could it have been done? Well, I guess if you want to go even further, technically, they trace their their roots back to the Trojans, right? The, the Trojan War, the the Aeneid, um, starring Aeneas, and how he escaped Troy and, you know, went on to Italy. So, technically, if you go even further, there's that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's interesting, to say the least. The dispute arose between two twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, when they led an expedition to found a new city next to the Tiber River. The brothers agreed that the ideal location for this new city would be somewhere on this set of hills, but they couldn't exactly agree on where to begin construction. One brother, Romulus, was primarily interested in the military defense of the city, and therefore favored a centrally located hill called the Palatine. The other brother, Remus, was thinking of trade and commerce, and so favored a hill that enjoyed easy access to the river, called the Aventine. This disagreement set off a full-scale 10 out of 10 argument. The group accompanying the brothers split right down the middle, until there was a Palatine faction under Romulus and an Aventine faction under Remus. There was no possibility of reaching a consensus, so each side agreed to go to their preferred hill, make some animal sacrifices, and await a sign from the gods. Remus and friends on the Aventine Hill soon saw six vultures flying overhead. The brothers claimed to be descended from Mars, god of war, and for obvious reasons, the vulture was his bird, so this made a lot of sense. Clearly, this was the sign they were waiting for. Remus marched over and informed his brother that his hill had received a favorable sign from the gods. Romulus responded, saying that just now, twelve vultures had landed on his hill. Remus was like, you're a damn liar, and insisted on seeing the vultures for himself. Remus was not satisfied by this. Sure, he argued, the gods had shown each brother a sign, but Remus's sign had appeared first, which must mean that the gods slightly favored his plan. Romulus was not having this. He argued that twelve vultures was obviously better than six vultures, and besides, they had actually landed on his hill, 
which must mean that that's where they were supposed to set down roots. Oh my goodness, why can't they just do both? <laughs> just make it all one. <laughs> that's what that's like the first thing that's going through my thought just just make both like just do it all at once right make it as big as possible but um yeah i, I other than i know they were both raised by wolves i uh, by like a she-wolf i think that was a a part of their origin story <laughs> and then one commits murder i don't know about anything else other than those two main points so, you know, the specifics of all of this is interesting to me. And, um, yeah, I... <laughs> Never mind, let's get to it. I was about to say something stupid. The argument escalated until each brother gave up and went back to their own camp. Romulus was <coughs> like to hell with this and began construction on the Palatine Hill. Job number one was digging a trench, which would later serve as the base for the city's walls. When Remus saw this, he and his supporters marched right over to the Palatine Hill. They may have brought weapons. Remus and company angrily crossed Romulus's little trench, and words were exchanged. Before too long, a fight broke out. When the dust settled, Remus was dead. According to tradition, Romulus struck the killing blow. Romulus would go on to build his city on the Palatine Hill, naming it Roma, or Rome, after himself. How much of this- Yeah, that that's the- it's almost mythological, right? The Romulus and Remus story, which almost makes you wonder, how did it all actually begin? Like, the- you know? Man, sometimes I wish we had a time machine, I would like to see it. Imagine it actually was true and that's how it went down, that, that'd be amazing actually happened? Maybe some of it, maybe none of it, but the important thing is that later generations of Romans fully integrated this story into their own mythology. But this is all kind of tangentially related to what I really want to talk about today. It may seem like a minor detail, but that trench dug by Romulus would go on to become one of the cornerstones of the Roman legal system. That trench is known as the Pomerium. The Latin word for city is urbe, or urbis, which itself is an offshoot of the word orbis, meaning circle. So why was the word city related to the word circle? In a legal sense, anything inside of a city's pomerium was the actual city, and anything outside the pomerium was something else. Mm. To be clear, most cities on the Italian peninsula would have had something resembling a pomerium, but for obvious reasons, Rome's was the most important by far. Over the centuries, Rome would grow beyond the Palatine Hill, and would go on to occupy all seven hills of Rome, and then some. A few early rulers tried to accommodate this by expanding the pomerium, but it was impossible to keep up with the city's growth. Eventually, reality set in, and people just accepted that in a legal sense, Rome's city limits were somewhere in the middle of a much larger, unofficial city. As this happened, the original walls of the Pomerium became less and less important, and over the centuries, they gradually faded away. The Pomerium eventually came to look like an open gap in between the buildings, with some ceremonial stone pillars to mark its place more or less an invisible line, well known to the locals, but easy for the untrained eye to miss. Entering the Pomerium was a highly ritualized experience, all tied up in the law and in Roman religious belief. The hyper-legalistic Romans felt that it was important to invent a legal justification for Remus's murder by arguing that any breach in the Pomerium, including literally just walking across the invisible line, represented a symbolic breach in Rome's defenses. Oh my. As such- So it was okay for him to murder his brother because of that. <laughs> it's cool, it's chill now guys, we've solved it. <laughs> Though, you know, I had heard- that like when Romans wanted to go to war, to war, they would always frame themselves as like I think the defender or 
I forgot. What am I looking for? They're kind of like, they, they frame themselves like it's justified all the time. Even if it's just, I want to go conquer something, there, there always had to be some type of justification where they are not the aggressor per se. I don't know how else to phrase it, but I think you might know what I'm talking about. Or that all their wars were defensive or something. I don't know. It just, just reminded me. <laughs> Defending, you know, because the Pomerium is so sacred, anyone crossing it, even the brother of the founder, right, is at wrong. So that that's interesting. Such crossing the Pomerium was a death penalty offense. If this is true, how did people get into the Pomerium? If you want to get super technical, the Pomerium stopped and then started again at a series of designated gates. According to Roman religious thinking, these specific gates were extremely important since they had been sanctioned by the gods way back in the time of Romulus. This fact became kind of absurd after the actual walls of the Pomerium faded away. Plutarch recounts the story of Pompey trying and failing to fit a group of elephants through one of these designated gates, even though the land to either side of the gate was completely open. It never even occurred to anybody to take two steps to the left and walk across that invisible line. <laughs> That's how seriously the Romans took the Pomerium. Wow. Dinner tonight. Make the reservation and get back to me about it. Chris, are you getting any of this? Yeah, it's so hollow. They won't just, I guess, circumvent or sidestep it. Yeah, that's interesting. In fact, in every meaningful sense, the Pomerium dominated political life. Rome's highest elected officials, namely consuls and praetors, were basically expected to carry out the day to day governance of Rome from within the Pomerium. You know, legislation, administration, court cases, religious rights, all that exciting stuff. Here, just as you would expect, elected officials were constrained by the laws of Rome, just like any other citizen. However, once consuls or praetors left the Pomerium, they were technically considered on military campaign, and as such wielded absolute power over life and death. Therefore, you can think of the Pomerium as the invisible line that separated the military world from the civic world. This role switching of Rome's elected officials- Yeah, isn't that something we heard about, is that like when people went into Rome, they, they couldn't be hold weapons. I remember there was a like an emphasis on that, you know, on the main Julius Caesar series, like or soldiers could not walk in. I guess there's that distinction between something as sacred as the Pomerium and the outside. Okay, that's interesting. It's interesting to see this is kind of a justification for that, it seems. All right, that makes sense to me was embodied in the behavior of their lictors, which were groups of six or twelve bodyguards that followed consuls and praetors around for the duration of their term. Inside the pomerium, lictors carried a ceremonial bundle of sticks. Once they left the pomerium, they added an axe to the mix, which advertised to the world the consul or praetor's expanded powers. In fact, there was probably an elaborate religious ceremony each time an elected official crossed the Pomerium, but the details of this are lost to us. You would think that this whole thing would lead to an abuse of power, but it really didn't. The Senate was usually within the Pomerium, most government buildings were within the Pomerium, most rich people lived and worked within the Pomerium, plus any decision was subject to a court challenge once they were out of office. In this context, the power available to consuls and praetors outside the Pomerium was pretty useful in a crisis, but didn't factor into normal domestic politics very much. Hmm. When it came to governors and generals, which the Romans called proconsuls and propraetors, the effect of the Pomerium became even more pronounced. When proconsuls or propraetors crossed the Pomerium, all of their legal command authority evaporated, instantly transforming them back into private citizens. 
Sometimes, for whatever reason, the Senate would need an active general to be present at one of their meetings, which presented a bit of a problem. When this happened, the Senate would sometimes agree to make the trek out of the pomerium and hold an ad hoc meeting in some kind of public building, like a temple. This became a big issue in the late 50s BCE, during the lead up to the Roman civil war between Caesar and Pompey, at which time Pompey was technically an active general. This resulted in a remarkable amount of ping-ponging around two different temples and theaters outside the Pomerium. This is fascinating to me. This is such an interesting system that, yeah, they're all taking very seriously. Like, you think... Yeah, you think, like, it's, it's such a weird, specific rule, you know, but... The fact that they're, they're going to such great lengths to preserve it is, yeah, I never realized. I, I, I usually had just heard, yeah, when you go into Rome, you can't bring weapons, and I thought that was kind of it. I thought of a more practical, right, demilitarized zone, but I realized the cultural, historical, mythological, political, um, religious reason uh, all combined into the primarium. Yeah, this opens my eyes to the practice of just the Romans, so, wow. Which I'm sure was annoying to a bunch of grumpy old senators. Another problem related to this was that in order to stand for office, people were required to enter the pomerium and declare their candidacy in person. If a prospective candidate was an active general, or even worse, an active general posted to the other side of the continent, their only option was to leave their post early and cross the pomerium, relinquishing their command. This tension between standing for election and retaining one's command should be familiar to anybody watching this. Again, going back to the Roman Civil War, one of the central questions leading up to it was what will happen to Caesar when he crosses the Pomerium? When it became clear that the likeliest result of giving up his command would be banishment or death, he didn't, which resulted in a civil war. However, and here comes the dumbest sentence I've ever written, civil wars were the exception and not the rule. <laughs> This same rule, stripping generals of their command when they crossed into the Pomerium, also applied to regular soldiers. Strictly speaking, there were not supposed to be soldiers on the Italian peninsula at all, but sometimes this was unavoidable. Yeah, I remember that he mentioned in one of the videos that Julius Caesar kind of abused this by sending a lot of his soldiers so they can go to Rome and basically vote on his behalf as private citizens, so... Typical Caesar, right? Breaking all the rules. <laughs> Caesar was kind of a rebel in his own right, wasn't he? And in cases like this, it was useful for everybody to know that entering the Pomerium for any reason would mean the end of their military career. Taken as a whole, this law basically made it impossible for any army to enter the Pomerium. Or, to put it another way, no individual crossing the Pomerium could claim to be acting on behalf of the Roman state. As we know, violating the Pomerium was considered a symbolic attack on the city itself, whether it came from a foreign invader or from a Roman soldier. Along these same lines, it may not surprise you to learn that weapons were forbidden within the Pomerium. Yep. This was taken quite seriously when it came to swords, but it wasn't that unusual for people to show up with clubs and daggers during riots or whatever, which I assume is just because those things are easier to hide. There were exceptions to this rule, though. During a national emergency, the Senate could appoint a dictator for a six-month term. Unlike every other Roman official, a dictator's decisions could not be vetoed. And more importantly for our purposes today, a dictator's command authority did not evaporate when they crossed the invisible line, giving them unchecked power to order soldiers into the pomerium. As a symbol of this power, a dictator's lictors were allowed to keep their axes and behave as if they were on military campaign at all times. Citizens knew what this meant, and it was a shocking sight to see. 
Obviously, the dictatorship was a dangerous tool, and so it was sparingly used throughout Rome's history. A similar mechanism that was much more commonly used was the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, or the Final Act. With the Final Act, the Senate empowered the consuls to defend the Republic by any means necessary. Any means meant that they could ignore laws, including the laws of the Pomerium. Yeah, I remember. He, he mentioned this during the main Caesar series. That it, Was it Pompey who got it, or someone else? I, I apologize, I don't know the specific individual. But I remember this being, he mentioned this, the final act. This may seem like a subtle difference, but it's important in terms of the legal system. Under the dictatorship, Rome put the law in the hands of one individual, with absolutely no oversight. Under the final act, everything remained the same, but the consuls could ignore certain laws if they needed to, with the senate providing oversight. Although the results may have looked similar, the final act was much less disruptive to the Roman legal system. The most famous usage of the final act came in 63 BCE, when the senate empowered the consuls to put down a conspiracy to overthrow the government, by any means necessary. The consul Cicero captured five of the conspirators, and then, without a trial, condemned them to death, and had them executed right there in the middle of the pomerium. Under the final act, Cicero was allowed to break the law like this, but the entire incident was highly offensive to the Roman people, and he paid a high political price for it. Hmm. Cicero. Wind turbine and industrial maintenance technician training at Universal Technical Institute of- Finally, let's talk about elections. This may be counterintuitive, but certain kinds of voting were actually forbidden within the pomerium. This rule had to do with the assembly of the centuries, the body that was responsible for empowering generals through the election of consuls and praetors. During these elections, citizens were divided into metaphorical military units, and these units voted together as a block. By now, it should be clear why this was a problem. We know that soldiers became private citizens when they crossed the pomerium, but how did that work for metaphorical soldiers? It was unclear. What about the consuls overseeing the election? Holding an election with a bunch of metaphorical military units was a little bit like commanding one big metaphorical army, right? If so, was that allowed within the pomerium? Legally, this was one big grey area. In order to avoid these tough questions, on every election day, a big chunk of Rome's population stopped what they were doing and exited the pomerium, making their way to the Campus Martius, or the Field of Mars, which was a relatively empty piece of land outside the pomerium that was deliberately set aside for military activities, both real and metaphorical. The only way to cross the pomerium was through one of the designated gates, and on election day, this turned a 20 minute walk into an all day ordeal. Rich people could get around this by exiting the pomerium early and staying in one of their villas near the campus Martius, but for everybody else, this was a real disincentive to vote. So, broadly speaking, we can say that the pomerium was the legal mechanism that separated Rome's military from Rome's government. For centuries, this law kept the peace, and stopped ambitious generals from entering the city at the head of an army. That is, save for one enormous exception. The Roman Triumph. <laughs> Which we will be we will be covering the Roman Triumph next. So that was interesting. I did not know the significance of the Primarium. Excuse me. <laughs> so and just like how serious it was. It's like this really sacred and hollow thing. And you know, I kind of have like a weird like respect just how much they respected it, you know? Like I said, it has its roots in so many things, mythology, religion, you know, military, politics. It's like, it's really, I don't know, it's just, 
it was interesting because, you know, he kind of mentioned the Pomerium at times, and then he would mention, you know, Romans not being able to bring weapons and, like, armies couldn't go in generals. So it's nice to have a bigger understanding. I should have watched this before I saw the Caesar series, but, um, you know, <laughs> either way, it definitely gives me a better insight into just how... I guess you can say intertwined religion was to the politics of Rome. Because, you know, nowadays I think we practice the separation of religion and politics completely now. But, you know, I guess back then, especially in societies, it kind of was. The, the two were kind of intertwined and they did affect each other heavily, you know. So, um, yeah, that was just very enlightening and i really really enjoyed that so i'm gonna be watching the triumph next we're gonna we've heard so much about the triumph and you know my mind's always just been it's a parade but obviously there's gonna be way more to it and i can't wait to learn so that's this video i'll see you all next time bye everyone